everyone, welcome back. My name is Maddie, and here on this channel, we make videos about LGBT issues and mental health. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, consider subscribing. So I am joined by my mentor supervisor, Kara, and we are going to be doing an interview just talking about how this internship came to be and what we're doing and things of that nature. So I'm actually going to be the one being interviewed, so I'm going to let Kara take it away. Yeah, I just have some basic questions. Hello, first of all. I didn't actually <laughs> say hello out loud yet. Um, yeah, so I don't know how much detail you've already gone into on your channel, but I keep things on my channel very vague. So we just recorded a brief intro announcement letting people know what we're doing for my channel, and that's the first time any of them are hearing about it. So if some of this is repetitive to some of you viewers here, I apologize, but I think it's all still good, fun stuff to know about, right? So first question is, as a pagan, pagan adjacent, witch adjacent, pagan-esque person, all of these <laughs> things that we tend to say, why divinity school? How did that thought come into your mind? And how did you then make the decision to attend divinity school? So... I've known for a while, like pretty much all of my life, that grad school was in my future. Like, number one, there are a lot of people, I won't say a lot, but like a higher than average number of people in my family with graduate degrees. And it was always kind of just expected that, oh, Maddie does well in school. She's going to go on to get a graduate degree of some sort. So that's kind of always just been placed on me. Mm. And so there's that. But also, I didn't go straight from undergrad to grad school. I took a couple years off. And honestly, those couple years off were not the best in any way shape or form like I really mm. missed being in school I didn't really like being in the workforce and so I knew that grad school had to be something that was in my future I didn't know what I was going to grad school for though and so there was kind of this sense of like I'm looking at every single grad school in the state and surrounding <laughs> states in the hopes that I'll find a program that interests me because I've got to do something, but I don't know what. And so I stumbled upon uh, Wake Div, Wake Forest School of Divinity, and I saw that like their mission was creating agents and architects of justice, reconciliation, and compassion. And so yes. when I heard that, I'm like, okay, so I don't know what on earth I'm going to do with my life. I was still very confused at the time. I'm a little bit clearer now. Not, I'm, 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 I'm a good deal clearer now. But at the time, I'm like, I have no idea what the hell I'm doing with my life. But I know I want to live a life of justice, reconciliation, and compassion. I want those principles to define whatever I end up doing in life. And so yeah. I decided that I was going to apply for Wake Div because I really resonated with their mission statement and then I got in. So it's an overwhelmingly Christian program and that's really difficult to navigate. But at the same time, I know at the end of the day that we share those common principles. And so mm -hmm holding that at the center as opposed to like holding Jesus at the center, which is something that I wouldn't feel comfortable doing, you know, holding right. those principles of justice, reconciliation, and compassion at the center have made it really possible for me to navigate uh, yeah. as a Wake Div student. Awesome. You kind of already answered a, a subset question, which we have already discussed before, which is like, how have you been navigating that so far as a pagan? And yeah, you seem to be doing really well with that. And that is something that I feel like as we chatted about before in a, in a private discussion, that it's kind of a skill that pagans necessarily have to have in today's society. I was also talking with uh, the director of the program about this in my meeting with him, that pagans just kind of have to learn how to exist in a predominantly Christian surroundings, especially here in the United States. I know it may be different um, demographically in other places, but especially here, 
we are surrounded by the assumption of Christianity, even if we're not in a religious based school at the time. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of have to choose whether to rail against that, which we do sometimes in some ways too, right? But, or to find ways to easily just adapt that script in our own head to kind of make it applicable to us when it's not being handed to us already translated for a pagan ear, basically. So I think you're doing very well with that. Uh, it seems like you have that natural ability. It hasn't been something that's like taken you a while to get around to, which is great. So Honestly, I would argue that I probably <laughs> you're gonna tell me it's really difficult. The Christian I, I, I rail against like the Christian assumptions more often than one might think. Like I know Well and we all do, right? So. Yeah. I can't remember what assignment it was, but it was something about like the nature of the Abrahamic God. And I'm yeah. like, I don't want to talk about this. I'm going to talk about Poseidon, Athena, and Medusa instead. <laughs> and like, yeah, no, yeah. See, to me, like, that's adapting. <laughs> oh, is okay, okay. No, it's both, right? Yeah, it's both. When I think of, like, and yeah, when I say rail against, that's something that it doesn't really make sense because I'm also an activist and I'm part of an activist tradition. So, like, yeah, we're railing against everything all the time. <laughs> but I guess what I mean by that is, when I've met some people in the past who all they want to spend their time on is talking about why they hate the existing religious structure in their area and they don't actually spend time developing their own, you know? So it's not the right wording perhaps that I'm using for it, but that's what I think of. I'm also trying to pull up now some of my documents um, from the internship stuff because I didn't think to get this out earlier, but we were just talking about their mission statement and maybe you have it handy or maybe you remember it better than I do because you've been in the program for a while, but the way they define ministry is quite broad. And yeah. that is something that made me feel a lot more comfortable with doing this too. You know, I don't have that off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't have the exact wording in front of me, but justice, reconciliation, and compassion being in that mission statement and then the description of ministry given is very broad. It talks about basically anywhere that you are engaging in those three things from the mission statement is ministry. And so that made me feel a lot more comfortable too, because at first when you asked if I'd be interested in this, I was like, well, yeah, but divinity school internship, like, aren't they going to want you to like work at a church? So the, you know, the closest thing I could think of is like a Unitarian Universalist church because they're non-dogmatic at this point it came out of christian traditions historically but is no longer a christian tradition today and i've definitely met pagans at every uu church i've ever been to magical practitioners all kinds of things so i thought like maybe that would be better you know i was like yeah i want to do this but how can we actually make this work for your requirements so um looking through the handbook and everything and realizing not only are they doing pretty well at adapting to the online thing for right now for people's internships, but also that they do define ministry so broadly. And so we could do something pagan and on YouTube and talking about the internet and have that count. And uh, the director of the program was really excited about it and really, really helpful. So that, yeah, made me, made me feel a lot better about it. Speaking of YouTube, you, we've sort of chosen YouTube as the, for lack of a better term, location, because this isn't taking place in a physical church building or any sort of in-person uh, nonprofit organization set up, nothing. So I'm sure some of this was probably affected by the fact that all the internships have to be online right now anyway, but given that, how did you decide that YouTube would be a viable option to actually request to do this as an internship? Did you feel like it would be an issue or yeah, how YouTube? I actually didn't think it would be an issue because so uh, every first year student is required to take a course called Art of Ministry, which is where you really start to define what it means for you personally to be a minister. And throughout the course, like the first half of the course was basically 
I don't know if this is right for me, the ministry aspect, because like the ministry aspect is taking away from what I really want to do with my life, is, which is producing content and making videos and things of that nature. And then about halfway through, I'm like, wait a minute, the work that I'm doing on YouTube is its own form of ministry. Like, especially like on my LGBT focus videos where I'm like, talking where I'm helping people like navigate their identity and figure out who they are and figure out how to exist in a world that so often tries to tell us we shouldn't and how to deal with coming out and how to deal with unaccepting friends and family and things of that nature I'm like this is ministry like what I'm doing mm -hmm. this is ministry and the art of ministry professor is also the director of the internships and the whole Art of Men program. And so he was really on board with what I was saying. He's like, yeah, I know that sounds like ministry. I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think you need to pursue this. And so when it finally came time to recommend an internship, I would have honestly been shocked if he had said, no, no, I don't think that working with a YouTuber is a good yeah. idea for you. Because like, it's literally what I feel called to do. I would have been seriously surprised. So. Um, it's definitely a non-traditional form of ministry, but I didn't think that that was going to be an issue. I thought that it was going to be pretty, pretty Good. well accepted. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, now having spoken to that director myself, I would also say, yeah, <laughs> it wasn't ever going to be an issue. But I didn't know if maybe, like, at the very beginning, I mean, did you have any qualms about entering the program as a pagan, even? Like, obviously, they do accept whomever you can apply and they accepted you cool but like was there any kind of reservations about that or doubts about how it would actually be in that way it wasn't when i was entering the program because the whole process of applying and attending like admissions meetings and whatnot like one of the one of the people who's in admissions was like, yeah, we have like almost 40 different faith traditions represented in this program. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that's wonderful. <laughs> like I'm gonna yeah. fit right in. So I didn't have any fears going in because I was kind of misled to believing that this was an interfaith program when in reality, it's not exactly. Like it's a pretty Christian program. The one explicitly interfaith course I've taken wasn't even in the divinity school. It was in the department for the study of religion. So it was okay. in the religion department. And so like it's really not an interfaith program. And it took me probably all of a month to realize like, oh no. What have I gotten myself into? <laughs> what is going on? Like, there there were so many times that I would rant to my fiance. I'm like, they want me to talk about the Bible. I Again. don't care about <laughs> this story. Like, not to say I don't care about the Bible, because I think that the Bible is a wonderful compilation of a lot of really powerful, insightful, wonderful texts. But at the same time, it's not my religion. And so there was this sense of like, why am I doing this? Why am I here? And so, like I said earlier, I would try to find a way to tie my own faith, my own religion into the conversation that I was having whenever possible. But there were so many times when it just wasn't possible. Like, I know there was one assignment I had in Art of Men where it's like, talk about a Bible story that's changed your life or something like that. Mm. And I'm like, ah! No. Yeah. Do I have to? <laughs> Can I talk about another ancient myth instead? Yeah. <laughs> that would be and for that cool. particular, normally I, I would get away with it, but for this one, it was like, I really want you to reflect on the Bible. And I'm like, but why? <laughs> why are you having yeah. this? And so, I don't know. It was just, there was definitely a point in the middle of it where I'm like, wow, I've gotten myself into something that I didn't expect. This isn't what I expected. I expected to have more opportunities to talk about my religion and dive into my religion and explore my religion and grow deeper in my religion. And so mm -hmm. that was definitely something that threw me for a loop. So, But you've stuck with it. Yeah. So yeah, there's 
<laughs> clearly there's, some way that you've developed to to feel like it's it's more good than bad it's mm -hmm. still worth it yeah um a lot of it like i said has been trying to find ways to tie my own perspectives and my own opinions into it and in situations where i can't do that because there have been situations where i can't do that a lot of it has just been the realization that there will be classes where I am able to do that. So you just kind of have to, it's just like an undergrad where you have to take certain courses mm -hmm. that have nothing to do with your major. In this program, I'm going to have to take certain courses that have nothing to do with my faith. And so it's just a matter of you got to power through and do what they ask you to do and hope that next semester you'll have more opportunities to be yourself. Yeah, because you have said there have been some professors who are much more open to having conversation from different perspectives that they don't know about and then there are those few that are kind of like i don't really know much about that let's just stick to this you know mm -hmm. um so yeah always going to be a little mix there i think maybe this is something you can't answer right now because there's still quite a bit of program left for you to get through but at this point just in the interest of reflection down the line because that's a lot of what vlogs are about at this point would you recommend that other people in the pagan sphere look into doing something like going to divinity school? Or do you think it's something that's still very like, it's gonna still be pretty niche? Or like, do you have a feeling like, oh, more people should be doing this? I would recommend divinity school to other pagans, honestly. Um, I have been blessed with a really incredible friend group who is more than open to discussing various religious facets and they want to dive further into different religions and they want to have conversations about the intersection of religions and just engaging in interfaith dialogue and things of that nature. And so there are people like that at Divinity School and I know there are, like, I have Christian friends who would be probably annoyed if there were no non-Christians at Divinity School because, like, yeah. they want to engage in dialogue. They want to be, they want, they want to engage and be a part of that larger discussion, that interfaith, syncretistic discussion mm -hmm. of religion and different religions and different faiths and different beliefs. And... I honestly, like, while I'm there, I feel like I'm not only educating my colleagues, but I think I'm also educating my professors, because most of my professors have never had to, I'm going to say, deal with a student like me. And yeah. so I think that because my background is in education, I was an education major, my sister's going into education, my mom is a teacher, my aunt is a teacher, like I come from a long line of teachers, mm -hmm. and I consider myself to be a teacher myself, especially on YouTube, I consider myself to be running an educational YouTube channel, and so I think that because I'm hardwired to want to educate people, then I'm in the right place right now because while I'm being educated, I'm also educating. And so I really like that balance that I feel like I've struck in at LinkedIn. Um That being said, if you're someone who is looking for, you know, Pagan 101 courses or Pagan 404 courses or whatever, mm -hmm. and you're hoping to like, really dive into paganism and like have paganism like i don't want to say spoon fed to you but like if you're looking for a pagan environment yeah. divinity school isn't the place this is a it, divinity school is a place of resistance it's a place of challenge it's a place where mm. you know you really have to wrestle and argue and defend and all of those really, really active verbs. And so if that's not something that you're necessarily like in the market for, I, I would say, no, you probably shouldn't go to divinity school. But if you're willing to go into it knowing that it's going to be a challenge, that you're going to be challenged and that it's not going to be a walk in the park, but you'll be a better person at the end of it, I'd say, yeah, go for it. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's a really great point. Um, there are definitely people who don't want to sit in a room and have to convince someone that their perspective religiously is valid in the conversation about the Bible, for example. And it would be nice if we all knew at all times that our perspective is always valid, whether that's religious wise or sexuality wise or whatever other identity wise. Right. But yeah, there are definitely spaces where like the way you even just described it, I was like, yeah, I don't know if I would like that every day. Like, you know, <laughs> like I feel like I, I have to be in the mood for that too. There are definitely uh, days that I wouldn't want to be doing that. And that's, that's an important boundary for everyone to draw, right? That we don't have to all be educating people about our practices in order to be personally doing them. So some mm -hmm. people just want to have their personal practice and might not ever want to engage academically with it. And that's fine. So yeah, I, I agree. I want to say that I don't, like when I say challenging or difficult, I don't want that to, I, it's, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's a hostile environment. Oh yeah. Like, I can count on one hand the number of times when a situation has gotten hostile in Divinity School, in the two semesters of Divinity School that I've been there. And so, like, I'm not saying, like, the people there are going to be telling you that you're going to hell, oh, yeah. although that has happened. Or, <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that, you know, they're going to be, you know, attacking you or anything like that. But, like, there is that sense of challenge where yeah. they're not going to let you get away with just saying, well, this is what I believe and I'm going to shut up. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, they're they're going to push you. Yeah, good clarification. Yeah, because I also did not even mean hostility when I say that. I mean, just like when, when I have bad anxiety days, there are days that I just don't want to have that conversation. Even if somebody is completely well-meaning and just wants to ask me, you know, repetitive questions to like dig down to the nitty gritty, which is something that I love to do with my practices. There are just some days where I don't really want to do that. You know, I don't really want to have to explain it. And I know that there are people who never like to engage that way. So thank you for that clarification, because I also did not mean hostility. So good. I want to make sure we, we know it's all, you know, these are educators. I recently mm -hmm. did a video on my channel talking about teaching and learning and that teachers are typically there to share information with you because they want you to learn in order to do better. And if a teacher is good at what they do, you end up knowing as much as they do and then can go on to learn more than what they've mm -hmm. taught you. Um, a, teachers are not there to keep you down. <laughs> and, uh, and, and like we've said, they're learning as well. And I think that is definitely true for me in mm -hmm. this situation. Also true for me in my history on YouTube. And it, it already seems to be true just from, you know, I've only spoken to the director of the program, not any of your individual professors, but I feel like that's definitely part of it for them too. Mm -hmm. So it's and cool. Also one last point of clarification there, like I think one thing about divinity school, and this is probably the case in any grad program and some undergrad programs as well, but definitely grad programs, is that your only educators aren't your professors. You're also in so many ways educated by your colleagues. Like I don't even call them like fellow students, like you're educated by yeah. your colleagues because like, they they have a lot, they have a lot to offer as well you know in terms of life experience and their own research and things of that nature and like all of the instances of hostility i mentioned those didn't come from professors those came from colleagues and they were difficult yeah. they were difficult but i still feel like i learned something or yeah. in the one scenario just created a nice poem that i really liked because i was really mad <laughs> so yeah I have done that as well. <laughs> Processing. Um, so we sort of touched on this earlier, but I think the last big point that I'd like to make, and then we can still talk about whatever else you'd like to talk about. But the last big point I'd like to make, we talked about um, the fact that the Wake Div program right now is very Christian centric, but that they do welcome other people. And in my conversation with the director, we talked about what us doing this internship situation might mean for them in the future. Because I think you are the first student they've had thus far who 
primarily identifies as a pagan rather than as something else not really specific to any denomination and also somewhat interested in earth-based religion but like as a pagan you're the first one that's number one a big deal let's just <laughs> presence that here for a second but also going into the future as they do more internships maybe they will have more pagan based students in the future i had thought of this independently myself before speaking with the director and then he said the same thing so we're both on board with thinking that what we're doing here can serve as a model for future internships that when they might have pagan students again there's already this bit of background and so i think a lot of the for example the personal study and research that i've been assigning you <laughs> to do mm -hmm. the things that you're coming up with from those assignments, number one, are gonna help me too, because I'm gonna have that additional research as well. Some of the things I'm having you look up are things I already know because you're learning basic things. But some of it is also like stuff that I've always thought would be really helpful. And maybe you can spend some of your time doing that and then it's gonna be helpful to me and other people too, both of our audiences, but also to Wake Div. So because the director and I had both independently thought of that, I'm wondering if you had any concept of that in your mind when you started this. And if not, have you given it thought since we've begun to like, just the fact that this is happening means that they now have this under their belts as a divinity school and, mm -hmm. and what might that mean for them for the future? Or have you not thought about it at all, which is totally fine too. It's not something that I've given a lot of thought to um in certain ways so to clarify i i have given a decent amount of thought to the fact that i didn't know for a fact that i was the first pagan in the program but i kind of gathered that i was yeah. i i was one of them <laughs> like I, I i gathered that there hadn't been very many students like me and so i definitely think that i'm kind of trailblazing a little bit where it's like when other and honestly people of any religion like you know come through any just any like non-christian related non-abrahamic religions come through i feel like i'm definitely creating space where it's like yeah no someone like you has been here before we got you you know yes um i honestly didn't think about the fact that this internship was trailblazing as well i honestly kind of thought that you know, this, I don't know, I like, I kind of, I've, I've kind of just been thinking, like, this, this is a unique internship, and it's probably not going to be used again, but I didn't think about, like, the actual, because I've been thinking, like, how, how, how many other pagan YouTubers, like, those two, that, that intersection, like, how, how many yeah. pagan YouTubers are they going to get at Wake Div? But I didn't think about the fact that, like, the work that I've been doing with divination and the work that I've been doing with researching and the work that I've been doing to deepen my own faith, my own beliefs, my own practice, you know, it didn't occur to me that, like, if another pagan student comes through, these are assignments that could be recommended for them. So, you know, I haven't thought about it all that much, but it is a really exciting prospect. Yeah. Well, and I love that you haven't thought about it that much because that's not it's not why you did it, right? Like you didn't yeah. just do this to, well, I was going to say to make it better for people in the future, but that is kind of what you're doing on your channel overall. But I guess what I mean is you didn't decide to do this internship thinking about, oh, I can be a trailblazer for all these people in the future. And that's my motivation for doing this. You really are focusing on your exploration of your faith and your religious practice and your theology which is really cool. And uh, I think everybody needs to spend time doing that. And we can also hold many paradoxes, right? So as we were talking earlier, I've now decided that like railing against the, the system and adapting it to suit our needs 
are not actually the opposing factors that I've been thinking they were in the way that I was talking about those, but they're just two sides of the same coin. Because hearing you describe how you do it and that you consider it railing as well as adapting, mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I do that too, actually. So, so I'm already changing the way that I, <laughs> that I think about things. But similarly, um, on YouTube, I've always talked about the paradox of the fact that as vloggers, we are only ever really speaking about our personal lived experiences and how things are for us as an individual. And we're not saying that it's exactly the same for everybody else because we can't, we can't always generalize. But knowing that at the same time, we are representative of our various identities and communities and groups that we're a part of. So we are simultaneously individuals and part of the larger whole. So I think the fact that we have to do that with YouTube also means you're doing that here because you are focusing on your practice and your experience of your beliefs and practices, but you are simultaneously, you know, you're in a program to become a minister, to get a master's of divinity. And that is, you know, inherently ministering to other people. So you are improving yourself for the benefit of community as well. And that's, yeah, we definitely need both of those things. Uh, I think some people might just be focusing on what good they can bring to other people and they forget to do the developments of themselves. And some people think that they're doing it just for themselves. And even if they're not formally sharing that with other people, they might be doing so informally because I might say that's how I ended up on YouTube <laughs> doing what I do, right? I thought I was just sharing my own stuff. And then over time, I realized people were looking at me as a teacher. And then mm -hmm. after a little more time, I embraced that, you know? So even though I still say it's informal, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I've been having a good time so far doing this. Uh, we've been very flexible because again, it's, it's completely new. It's not like I already have a curriculum that I use with students. I've never worked one-on-one -on -one with a student before. I've done presentations and workshops and classes and things like that, but nothing quite like this. So I've definitely thought about it for years. I've had things milling about in the back of my mind and that's kind of what I've been pulling from. But I've really appreciated your patience and willingness to communicate and our almost daily back and forth clarification <laughs> questions. What are we doing today? Or just like, hey, uh, are you done with that thing? Do you want more stuff to do this week? Yeah, I'm, I'm running out of stuff to do. Give me more. Or like, no, no, this one's taking me a really long time. Let's hold off on the rest. Like it's very, we're building it as we go. And it is a collaborative experience in many ways, I think. Just because I have some ideas of basic topics to then give you doesn't, you know, it's a mentor mentee situation. It's a teacher student situation, but it's very fluid, mm -hmm. you know? So I like that. Was there anything else you wanted to ask me for your audience or? There's one answer that I actually wanted to give for why YouTube, but it didn't quite factor into the actual question you asked. So I don't know. Oh, okay. But, um, the reason I started on YouTube in the first place was because um, I really wanted, I'm a strong proponent of the principle of pay it forward. And so I make videos about topics where other YouTubers have helped me throughout um, various things. So like, I, when I was first trying to figure out whether or not I was trans, I turned to trans YouTubers and they helped me figure out that I was. And when I was trying to figure out you know, if I was pagan, I turned to pagan YouTubers and they helped me figure out that I was. And when I was trying to figure out whether or not I had OSDD or DID, I turned to DID and OSDD YouTubers. And obviously they couldn't tell me that I was that required a diagnosis, but they got yeah. me on the right track to realize like, hey, uh, yeah, no, that sounds, that, this is familiar. Like, this is, these are things that we experience too. And so, um, kind of the why YouTube is just because I feel the need to pay it forward because YouTubers helped me and um, now I'm in a position to help other people and like I'm getting stories and they honestly give me chills just by you know the fact that I have become for some people 
what other like YouTubers have been for me. Like there was this one story in particular. In one video, it's called 10 Signs I Was Trans But Didn't Know It. And I was talking about how, um, again, like I said, I turned to trans YouTube to try to figure out where I fit on the gender spectrum. And um, what I would do is there was this one game, Final Fantasy XV, which you could play and just like roam the world and fight and like just like mess around and have fun. And so it was pretty open world. Not completely open world, but it was fairly open world. And so I would mute the game and just play around while listening to trans YouTubers on my phone. And I would kind of do that for a while. And I got a comment on that video saying, you'll never believe it, but I'm watching your video while playing Final Fantasy XV on mute. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. oh, shit, it's come full circle. And so just things like that have just been really, honestly, exciting but also humbling just to realize that you know this is why i started in the first place i'm actually doing it so yeah that's awesome this is going to be at the end of the video but i just want to say to everyone happy pride month oh yeah we're officially oh, yeah. in pride month and i don't know i i talked about it a lot in my last video but like <laughs> i got my rainbow shit on yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay um look at this i have a rainbow chain mail oh damn that that a friend made they were like learning how to do chain mail and then they just did this little like flower of pride nice. basically and then i have my take pride in your love life nice. can't see it there we go <laughs> i wore that to work yesterday hi friends after car showed off her super awesome pride merch we got to talking about video editing and things like that and i completely forgot to film my outro and honestly the outro is my favorite part of our videos so, if you enjoyed this lengthier than usual video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more content just like this. But more importantly, remember that you're wonderful, and that the world is a better place because you're in it. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again in the next video. Bye!